Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 25th, 2011. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. But this week, we follow up with Brad Sturgeon on his IBU ceiling experiment. He answers your questions and talks about some new tests on the same beers we sampled in San Diego two months later. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. Also, you can find our brewer's logbooks to help you log and track 50 batches of beer. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our Facebook page, our show page on Facebook, is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we greatly appreciate your support. And now uh, there is a, an Amazon.co.uk link on there, too. Uh, it's just below the standard black rectangle there that is the American site. So uh, you guys over across the pond there in the U.K. can click on that link and, and help us out. And uh, we'll test that and see how it works. I appreciate the suggestion uh, of the listeners who have suggested that. I finally figured out how to do that. Uh, we also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. And you can find our Basic Brewing iPhone and Android podcast apps on their respective stores. And if you're listening on that app right now, you can go to the Extras section and check out the PDF uh, that uh, Brad and I will be talking about here shortly. Or you can go to the website at uh, basicbrewingradio.com uh, and look at the uh, description of this episode and uh, download the PDF if you're on a computer. Uh, we are also on the BlackBerry podcast directory now, too. Uh, I'm going to write, uh, jump right into the interview because uh, we talked for a good long time. Yeah, this is a follow-up on the show from a couple of episodes ago where we were uh, testing uh, whether we could reach an IBU ceiling or a limit of IBUs in a volume of beer. So if you haven't listened to that one yet, you might want to go back into the archives a couple of episodes and listen to that one and then listen to this one because uh, it will make this this episode will make more sense if you do. Uh, I do appreciate all the email that uh, I've been getting lately. Uh, I've been answering them, you know, via the via the email, but I haven't been uh, talking about them on the show. We need to do a show to uh, to catch up on email on the podcast. Uh, but uh, since Brad and I talked for a good long time, I just want to jump right into it. We're Brad Sturgeon. Welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Uh, thanks, James. It's always good to talk to you. I pre- I know you're busy. You're you know you're you're a teacher, and you're teaching up there at uh, Monmouth College, and uh, this is a busy time of year for you. So I, I appreciate your uh, taking even more time out to play with us. Uh, I mean, to do this important work. Uh, that <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's one of my challenges to convince people that this is an academic pursuit. And so uh, with it being the first day of classes, actually, uh, I've put a note on my door that says, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Be out in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> well, this I mean, this is, uh, we were talking yesterday, this is really what science is all about, isn't it? I mean, this is doing an experiment and winding up asking more questions at the end of it than you figured you were going to answer. Yeah. Um, Actually, it's uh, knowing when to stop is probably one of the uh, the best traits in here. And I haven't learned that when it comes to hops just yet because every time I do an experiment, I learn a little bit more. So uh, it's it's exciting for me to have this and, and bring it into my classroom. So so to, to recap, uh, for those who may not have heard the, uh, the episode uh, of a couple of episodes ago where we uh, talked in San Diego – my challenge to you was to find the ceiling of uh, IBUs in a beer, and we came out with some surprising results. Yep. Uh, yeah, and I guess that data is is posted on your webpage. Right. 
uh, if people want to go look at that and look at some of the pictures of our little system that we use to do one gallon brewing. Yeah, you essentially did uh, four small batches and uh, added progressively more hops in there, uh, only boiling at 60 minutes in these. Uh, and you came up with a ceiling of uh, around 51.8. Yeah, 52. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that was surprising for a lot of people because it's, you know, been widely reported and sort of known as common knowledge that uh, the ceiling for IBUs in beer is supposedly around 100. So what you came up with was about half that. So we were surprised all around. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of aspects that are kind of in, in place here. This being a very simple extract beer. Uh, you know, you've talked about on your show about things related to uh, whether you should add the dry malt extract at the beginning of the boil or towards the end just for sanitization um, and how that might affect the hop utilization. You know, there's just so many different uh, dimensions of experiments we could do. And um, uh, I at least have another few years on my life, and I look forward to doing some of those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there, but I know of that is. Yeah. <laughs> but there, there was one thing that wasn't in contention, and that was the perceptions of bitterness that we had sitting around the table, uh, and the fact that all but one of us <clears throat> uh, <laughs> could could pick out the beer that was the least bitter, and had a, a very difficult time uh, differentiating between the other three beers that were you know, at or around that ceiling that, that you had, uh, that you had hit. Um, right. so, so that was, you know, that, that's something that's, that's not controversial in my mind is, uh, or it, it is interesting in that it, it, uh, generates discussion on how much hops that you, you know, how, what good do you get out of adding more hops at the, at the 60 minute uh, point because it seems like from that experiment and our perceptions that whether the number is fifty or whether the number is a hundred, whatever, uh, there is a point of diminishing returns as far as bitterness, perceived bitterness is concerned, of adding hops at the beginning of the boil. So all that makes sense. Yeah, right. Well, and and again, when you look at this data here, you might say to yourself, "I want to do an extract beer just like what we did." but you want the IBUs to be 80, uh, while the the data will say that you could add as much hops as you want in there at 60 minutes and you're never going to get IBUs of 80. Yeah. It, it clearly peaks for this particular recipe, which is very simple, with just a single 60-minute addition. You, you know, it's an exponentially approaching somewhere around, you know, 50s, um, you know, I mean, with the four beers we did, we didn't hit the top of that exponential, but, you know, you're not going to get anything more than 55 out of this, even if you start throw, start throwing in pounds instead of ounces. So, Yeah, it's a, it was very interesting to me, and it, it opens the door for a lot of follow-up experiments, uh, adding mid and late hop additions and seeing what effect that has on the, on the beer. Um, and you know, those, those may be in the works. I mean, I would, I would love for you to, you know, take some more time to do that. I know, I know you're very busy and I know your, your, uh, time and work is, is valuable. Um, so, and you know, that you've got a the class is full of, of uh, students that are, that are eager to, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> to <Yeah>. learn. <laughs> no, and, and we do have a little brew club here on campus that, uh, just sort of a select group of folks and, with uh, we've gone through a few iterations about how you'd go about having these sorts of brews, and we've learned how not to do it. And I think the recent this one gallon system we have, if if I could get students to come in, you know, once a week and just alternate nights, you know, we could knock out an experiment. You know, my my big point is that when there's other people involved in the brewing, you know, then you you have another variable in the situation. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the best thing is we wait for the summer and just let me be uh, micromanaging and do it all myself, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is good and fun for me. Uh, 
but it slows the rate at which we can do this uh, this work. So, but no, I look forward to it. I, I have all intentions of continuing to work on this with you, James. I appreciate you letting me be involved in the conversation. And and it could be that that uh, I do the lab work in my kitchen uh, and brew certain recipes that you and I uh, discuss and agree upon. And, you know, I control the the variables as much as I can in my environment and then send you samples. And that way you just have to do the work on the back end. Yeah, well, and I was kind of surprised that none of your listeners commented on that heating profile that I had in the document. Um, like some of my students, maybe they just didn't read what I gave them, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. But, you know, there that just, you know, again, I try to come clean as a scientist and that I want your listeners to see that, you know, I'm I'm transparent. I, I will tell you exactly what the temperature is. And with that temperature profile, you see that the rate of heating up the wort uh, was good, but I was on occasion distracted. Um, and like in one case, I forgot to add the hops, mm-hmm. believe it or not. I mean, that was the reason I was there. But I had actually reached the boiling point, and it took me another, you know, eight minutes or something to realize, oh, crap, I'm supposed to be doing something now. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, I'm not perfect in the way I do things, but, you know, the question is, would that change hop utilization? Well, no, and I was very particular about that idea that once I did add the hops, I had a timer set to go to 60 minutes mm-hmm. because I know that was the critical part. Um, and actually, when you look at that data, too, there's a cooling profile, which I think is almost as important uh, to make sure that we knock that work down in temperature as fast as we can. And I think I was pretty consistent with that, but um, I might have even had a temperature probe that kind of acted differently on two different days because the boiling point seemed to be different by a significant amount. Hmm. Uh, but I think that was more of a measurement artifact than it was, I mean, you know, where it boils at the boiling point. <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, and unless so, again, un- I, unless your uh, your uh, altitude above sea level dra- dramatically changed uh, yes. in the day. <laughs> I thought there was something odd about that day. <laughs> Did uh, your ears pop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll have to check my notebook. I'm sure I documented it if I did. <laughs> Well, we we opened up uh, the uh, open up the line to the listeners uh, for feedback and questions uh, following uh, that episode, and uh, one of the one of the the gist of of a lot of these uh, boil down, frankly, to uh, does Brad know what he's doing, and does his equipment work? <laughs> so, <laughs> so let, can we address that right away? Yeah. Um, well, I think it was uh, Fred, one of your listeners, called in and or wrote in and asked some of these questions. Um, so as far as reproducibility, in this round of doing the Beer 23 assay, um, I did three samples. So I, I did the measurement for each beer in triplicate. And in my worst sort of uh, standard deviation um, my numbers were different by one and a half IBUs, sort of plus or minus one and a half IBUs. Um, and that was only one of the beers. Actually, in three of the four beers, uh, each of those triplicates essentially were no different than a half an IBU unit. So um, I think my reproducibility, at least given a single beer and doing the assay, uh, should be pretty um pretty good. And again, I, I like to go back and check that. And, and as a scientist, we should do things like that in triplicate. Uh, sometimes we get a little sloppy and you might have called me sloppy before uh, and not reporting a standard deviation. But I've done this assay probably over 100 times. And so you kind of know when uh, and where to allocate your time mm-hmm. and attention. Um but, you know, these are always good things when uh, when people ask me that question, you know, how do you know that I'm doing it right? You know, I, I go back and I look through the assay. I, I have a printed copy that I can usually have or access at any time. And, uh, you know, there was some specifics in the assay that, you know, I didn't hadn't read in a while. And so things like the solvents that you use, there's the octal alcohol and the iso-octane. And, you know, they make note of... 
uh, it being a certain grade of material and um, in talking about what kind of background signals might exist in there. So I, I did go into the lab and I measured the background signals and the solvents that I'm using all seem to be um, within the specs. And if not within the specs, they're pretty darn close. Um, you know, the the having to go buy another $300 bottle of a solvent that just adds to my waste disposal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't imagine from my work in a brewery that, that people are going to be working at that level of detail. Um, um, so you in, know, other words, other, in other words, you're fairly confident. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm always confident in what I do, right? I mean, <laughs> I can tell you exactly what I did and, you know, and as far as the assay too, one of the things um, is that I do not have in my current lab a wrist action shaker, um, and uh, I have a, a quote printed out to purchase one for twelve hundred dollars, um, and I might just do that. But a wrist action shaker, just like it says, is meant to mimic the wrist action, and um, it's a fifteen-minute uh, shaking procedure. And I feel as though I'm very capable of shaking something for 15 minutes. <laughs> now, uh, those of you who su- suggested I do things in triplicate added to my uh, workload. And so I have a little bit of uh, uh, additional muscles maybe from this morning or recovering from that work. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, I had my, uh, my computer science colleague come up who's very analytical about things and went through the procedure with me. And uh, he got to experience the shaking as well. And I think he can attest to the fact that we mechanically shook those samples significantly and according to the 15-minute assay uh, protocol. And I I want to, this disclaimer, I'm not responsible for any uh, carpal tunnel injuries <laughs> that you guys uh, <laughs> incurred. Yeah, well, it's actually a good exercise. I've learned that when I do it, I just can't stand in one place i have to actually go walk around the floor (laughs) and talk to people and uh, you know when you walk out of the lab with a handful of samples shaking usually it's pretty easy to come up with a conversation (laughs) Uh, as long as you got your uh, ipod or android device keeping track of your time i think uh it's a perfectly wonderful way of carrying out the activity so (laughs) Uh, so so uh you did uh take samples uh that were, have been in the bottle since uh, we talked, uh, and then last night you you took those samples and and did the test on each of them three more times. Uh, so that should answer uh, Fred's rep- repeatability uh, question, um, and and we'll we'll talk a bit about in a little bit about what the what the results that you got from that, uh, but. But let's go, or do you want to talk about that now? I mean, uh, well, I, I, I'll let you run the show. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Somebody's got to be in charge. That's uh, right. So, so let's talk. Let's talk about. We we talked uh, when we were in San Diego about. Uh, well, first of all, you did uh, sort of benchmark testing with some commercial beers, and they the results that you got were lower than the reported IBUs. And so the question arose, well, you know, could it could the those results be lower because they've been sitting in the bottle for so long? And so now we've got beers that you made for the experiment that we have a benchmark uh, that you took back in June of the IBU levels in these beers. And so it's been a couple of months that these beers have been in the bottle. And you did the test again. And what did you what did you find out? Yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, when your your listeners have a look at this new follow up data, uh, the graph becomes very evident in that uh, the beer in on June sixteenth, the brew number two, which had the least amount of hops, the point one ounces, um, equivalent to sort of a half an ounce per five gallon batch. Uh, came in at about a 24 IBU measurement, and when I did this last night, it came in at 16. Mm. So we have a, a decrease of about 31 percent in that IBU measurement from when we did it in June and August. And similarly, 
all the other beers dropped by uh, not the same percentage, but they all dropped significantly. And we've added that data to the uh, the Excel graph that we have that shows the Rager and Tinseth uh, calculations and what our original data was and what our data is now. So you found something interesting in that the the more bitterness uh, that each of these beers had, it seems like the less they percentage wise they lost over time. Yeah, well, and and I think uh, you might think about uh, you know when we bottle condition beers as home brewers, um, I don't do any um, real high tech filtering of my beers. And so, you know, the beers that I sampled last night, you know, had a little bit of standard sedimentation on the bottom. And if that material had anything to do with hops uh, or could have some properties that might, um, you know, have a surface for which the hops could stick to, um, you know, that material fell out of solution. And so, you know, if you think about a beer that has a low IBU, if you take, you know, 10 IBUs out of a lower beer, that's a greater decrease. Mm -hmm. You take 10 10 IBUs out of a higher IBU beer, that's a smaller uh, decrease, right? And so, you know, that seems to be reasonable that if the material that fell out of the suspension during this time where it sat in the bottle for two months, you know, had some IBUs to it, I mean, I, I certainly could always go back and do it again where I decant off that beer and run an IBU test on the sludge. Mm-hmm. Uh, that might be uh, informative. Um, yeah, where did those IBUs go? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And and actually, and that's one of the things as a scientist you always try to account for. You don't want to just show a decrease in something, but you want to make sure you know where it went. And so that kind of is what leads me to thinking along those lines. Um, but there really is no assay from the American Society of Brewing Chemists that I know of that would test sludge for IBUs. Uh, but, you know, and, and again, you may not end up with 10 milliliters of it either, which is what the assay calls for. But again, I, I wouldn't have a problem scaling those numbers. But again, then I'm not following the protocol as it's been worked through their technical committees. So beer number two, which started out at 23.8, went down to 16.4, a decrease of 31%. Beer number three, uh, which uh, was – and why is there no beer number one? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, beer number one was the one that that you uh, explained to me that you do get larger boil-offs. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and so that beer number one is actually a pretty tasty beer, but it has a original gravity about ten ninety. Okay. <laughs> uh, which might not have been the best way to conduct this experiment. So. Right. So, so yeah. batch number three started out at forty three point five, went down to thirty two, a uh, decrease of twenty six point four percent. Batch number four started out at forty nine point five, went down to thirty seven point two, a decrease of twenty four point eight percent. And brew number five uh, started out at 51.8, went down to 43.7, a decrease of 15.6%. So, I mean, that in itself is very interesting. The fact that over two months you can lose a bunch of bitterness uh, in your beer. Yeah, well, and and it would have been a a good part of the experiment to sort of tie in that perceived bitterness with it too. Mm. Uh, But when I get in the research lab, uh, I sometimes am hesitant to be drinking beer while I'm working with these organic solvents. <laughs> Not that my lab technique is so bad that, <laughs> well. that I contaminate myself, but I kind of get in this mental frame that, you know, I'm doing this analytical work. Um, you know, I, well, okay, I did sample one, and it takes <laughs> it about the same, you know, but I, I didn't do a, you know, I didn't have you, Steve and Andy, and the other guys there to, to uh, uh Use your buds there to help out. So. Right. Well, and, and uh, you know, it's interesting uh, thinking about bitterness over time because I, w- I was talking to a professional brewer the other day, and he was talking about comparing uh, hops from one year to another. And it's difficult to do that because you can't just take a, 
a bottle of beer from last year and compare it with this year's fresh beer because, you know, it's changed over time in the bottle. Uh, so you you basically have to go off of your perceptions the first time you tasted it. I guess this would be something similar. We would have to go off our memories of our perceptions of tasting it two months earlier uh, because you I, can't really compare apples to apples that way. Well, and I think that's one of the things, again, in science that we want to have a sort of a true yardstick that we can use to make sure that Brad can do the analysis. But, you know, the the problem is, is if... Uh, you know, if I send a sample off to, you know, the ASBC uh, quality control lab and they do that assay for me, which we can pay to have that done, um, you know, when I did that experiment either yesterday or back in June, I mean, there's two different numbers. Mm-hmm. What are they going to get? Well, hopefully they'll get a number closer to the uh, date yesterday. Um, but But there really is no benchmark, you know, kind of with these other beers here that we the commercial beers we looked at, you know, those decreases are roughly the amount that's decreased that we see over the two month period. And I don't have any way of necessarily knowing what the date of those beers were that I had right. used. Right. Um, yeah. I, so yeah, you, speak Julian, <laughs> you, you have at the, at the bottom of the sheet, which I will post uh, on the extras tab in the app. And I'll also post it in the description of this episode. Uh, on basicbrewingradio.com. Uh, but if you look at the uh, the reported IBUs of the commercial beer uh, that you uh, tested and then the actual, uh, your actual test, uh, the, the discrepancy is sort of within uh, the range that you found with the beers, your homebrew being in the bottle for a couple of months. So, uh, you know, that, that could attribute, or we could attribute to the difference in and what you found to the reported IBUs to just age of the beer. Yep, uh, that seems reasonable. Um, and again, as as we kind of briefly talked, I mean, the procedures that are done in a commercial brewery can be very different. Um, you know, whether you take a sample right out of the bright tank and do the analysis. I know that in a bright tank, uh, the analytical folks are and the brewers are trying to make sure the carbonation's right. So you have access to a lot of beer. Um, I don't think I would necessarily want to use that beer for working in the lab. Um, but, you know, at the time of bottling, there's actually a lot of things that go on. You know, they're trying to make sure that you get a proper fob on the beer, meaning that it foams up good to displace the oxygen that might be in the headspace of a bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I know that when I had some experience in the lab, that was one of the things we do is, you know, pull those bottles off the line and make sure that there wasn't too much oxygen in the headspace. And so there's a lot of things going on. So I would guess that doing IBU assays would be something you do a couple days, maybe after or maybe later that afternoon on a beer. Hmm. And, uh, you know, at that time, once it's in the bottle, they've run through a filter, um, which should have removed any sediment that would come out of a beer. Um, But again, we know that some commercial beers do have sediment in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of us uh, enjoy that sediment as part of our future brewing and, uh, <laughs> and uh, other aspects. I mean, you certainly couldn't do that with a with a wit beer or some sort of uh, German wheat or something like that. So, mm-hmm. well, let's let's go to uh, more questions. Uh, this is from Graham in Bucking, Buckinghamshire, England. Uh, it's either Buckinghamshire or Buckinghamshire, so I apologize for being uh, incorrect 50% of the time there. Uh, Graham says the results of this ex- experiment directly contradicts your experiment, uh, the collaborative experiment number three of uh, March 4th, 2010. In that experiment, your concentrated half volume wort boil have had a gravity of uh, 1.127. And an effective bitterness of about 130 IBUs during the boil, which when diluted in the fermenter to the final volume ended up at 61 IBUs. Uh, not much sign of a saturation curve there. And that he's referring to the partial boil experiment where I, I did three different batches of beer, uh, boiling, either doing a full boil, doing a partial boil, and doing a partial boil with the extract added late, I believe is the way that went. 
and the uh, we found that um, if you do a concentrated wort and then top it off with uh, with water, uh, we measured, and I think Blake Lyons uh, was the one who did the IBU testing on this one. Uh, they wound up in the 60s. Um, so, number one, that proves that your machinery does go above 50 something. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that it that it is possible to uh, to go above, uh, but also th- you would think that if your uh, beer had an original gravity of 60 some odd IBU or a final gravity of 60 some odd IBUs, that the concentrated wort would have at least twice that many, um, you know, before you diluted it, right? I mean, uh, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, well, and, and you know, the thing is that we'll just point out that the assay was done on a beer that measured out in the 60s. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, again, this data that we have that topped off at 52 was for a very simple beer, and I guess it wouldn't surprise people that you could get other, um, you know, hop character, certainly in late, uh, mid and late edition hops, and that might add to the IBU measurement. Um, The other thing that that comes into mind is that when you're doing a, you know, uh, that concentrated boil, uh, it might have actually had those higher IBUs or those higher dissolved alpha acids in there, or, or that conversion might happen but nothing necessarily says that they were soluble at the time. When you add in the other volume of water, you know, you, if you have some compounds in there that are soluble, well, then they will dissolve in that particular beer hmm. or in that that liquid. Um, you know, so you know, there's a lot of variables that go into that. Each one of those could be another dimension of an experiment, but it that I don't find it contradictory. I find it sort of a different experiment. Hmm. Um, like you said, you know, our instrumentation can measure an IBU over 52. Uh, and actually, that wasn't necessarily the gist of the experiment. It was to work with that beer. Um, you know, I have no doubt that our spectrometer can measure absorbance units well above uh, two absorbance units. Whether it's linear in that range is uh, something that we've identified as not. Um, and again, I'm not working with a you know, eBay purchase piece of equipment here. <laughs> uh, this is a Hewlett Packard uh, 8453, or now called Agilent. Um, it's a it's one of the most commonly used in a lot of different industry settings. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a different beer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the thing is, is that you know, in that concentrated uh, wort, if the isomerization of these alpha acids again, which is just a temperature and the time dependent phenomena. If those are in are being isomerized, but the solution becomes saturated, well, if you add in a bunch of water and they're still in there, well, they will dissolve. Hmm. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the the principles of solubility. It's based on a certain grams of material per volume. If you add more volume, you know, they might go into solution. So if uh, they're if they're hanging around, say at the bottom of the kettle, and uh... As when you're transferring them into uh, the fermenter, uh, that might rouse them up a bit, and then you add the water, and then they go into solution as opposed to sitting at the bottom. Sure, yeah. Um, and again, our beers, when we transfer them, uh, even after chilling them, are you know they're far from being clear at that point. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and again, depending on how cold you your wort chiller and your mechanism there. Um, you're going to get a different cold or hot break or something like that that might affect how that transfer of insoluble components might go into the final beer. And so I think it's just another set of experiments. You know, I don't claim to understand all that, the details going on there. But, again, we could have, as one of your other listeners talked about, well, why don't you just measure the IBUs at every single step of the process? Right. And and that's that's a different experiment. We could certainly do that. Uh, but one of the things I'm always worried about is, you know, if you have hot material, 
and you have some uh, some lupulin gland material that maybe isn't fully soluble, if I take that and throw that through this beer 23 assay where those resins are exposed to this organic solvent where these compounds are fully and completely soluble, I'll dissolve beta acids, I'll get the humulene, I'll get everything that has any sort of ring structure and more, and those will all add to the absorbents, making it appear as though the IBU measurement's higher. Ah. Um, but, you know, the, the beer assay says, you know, take 10 milliliters of a chilled carbonated beer, right? And so, again, once I start to deviate from the assay that is specified by the ASBC, well, I'm no longer doing the same experiment. Hmm. And, again, it hasn't been validated for that type of experiment. So, again, I, I know I try to make it sound more complicated than it might be, but in reality... There's a lot of work that needs to be done if we want to come up with a single answer for this. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. That was Dan from New York who asked, you know, can you can you measure it at various points in the in the process? And to to show you how different this beer was from your single hop edition at 60 minutes, this was a, a double IPA recipe, and this is a two and a half gallon recipe that I did for the the partial boil experiment and the no Irish moss experiment. Started out with 0.85 ounces of magnum at 60 minutes, 0.25 ounces of Simcoe at 30 minutes, 0.65 ounces of Centennial at 15 minutes, 0.5 ounces of Cascade at 5 minutes, 0.5 ounces of Amarillo at zero, and then one ounce of Cascade dry hop. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, it would be... Obviously, the the next step in this experiment would be, you know, how does late hop uh, additions or how do late hop additions affect uh, the IBU measurement with this protocol? Um, you know, even even to the point of you know dry hopping. How does dry hopping? We know that dry hopping uh, supposedly doesn't add much in the form of perceived bitterness, but you know, do those. Uh, Un- isomerized alpha acids hanging around in the beer, uh, you know, that are compounds from the hops. When you actually do the experiment and dissolve those with the, you know, the solvent, does that up the IBU number? So, right. Uh, yeah. Well, and Graham also pointed out in his email email something about uh, pH dependence, and, and right. I think uh, some of your guests. Um, are starting to talk about pH and Zymergy had the article. Um, uh, Kai. Mm-hmm. Kai Troister. Troister, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, Kai. <laughs> um, uh, and pH is, of course, a really important thing, and it's a very um, sort of basic underlying sort of principle that we always have to be worried about. And actually, one of the things that I like about doing this beer assay that I can use sort of in an educational mode is that one of the steps, the first steps that you have to do is you have to add in uh, acid to the beer. And actually by doing that, you drop the pH way down. And what, you know, again, for any of the more technical folks around, you essentially protonate all of those alpha and iso alpha acids and beta acids even. You protonate most everything that's in there, making them in a neutral form so that they can be readily soluble in the organic phase. Um, and so, you know, that is a, a very well-known um, fact about pH and making alterations. And again, when we're brewing beer, we don't necessarily, you know, we're not shooting for, you know, some sort of really acidic condition or a basic condition. We're kind of in that four to five range. And at the four to five range, you start to set up some pretty complicated situations where you have protonated and non-protonated and, um, you know, it's it's kind of a tough place to work. And, again, I think it's uh, something that we'd have to do a lot more experimentation to kind of really um, work with these individual compounds. So, And th- we're entering our seventh year of uh, of this show, and, and you've introduced a new word. So Is that right? Pro- protonate. I don't think I, I've ever heard that word on this show. So <laughs> congratulations. That's the- oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> You'll insert the claps there, right? So- <laughs> 
that was a, a line from the San Diego, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, wow, that boy. Uh, I could say things about inserting clap, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and editing, I think, is another term. <laughs> Uh, Matt from Sydney, Australia, uh, says uh, something along those lines, uh, along the lines we're talking about. If a beer is hitting its IBU limit, then the maximum quantity of alpha acids have been converted into isomerized alpha acids. But with flavor additions, you're introducing a new set of acids that don't get the same time to convert. We know the later additions give different characters, but it would be fascinating to see how those differences are expressed when the beer is dancing along the limit of IBUs. Would the bitterness push out the flavor and aroma, or would the flavor and aroma offset the bitterness? So he's talking more along the lines of, of perception rather than uh, rather than you know lab measured IBUs. Uh, but that's you know that's another that's another question. I mean, uh, we're kind of concentrating on how the machine perceives IBUs, but you know probably the more important question is how we perceive those IBUs. Right. Well, and. Um Actually, I've had a chance over this last summer to talk a little bit with Gordon Strong about his new book that he has out. And um, my colleague, Logan Mayfield, has been playing around with doing some cold steep uh, with some of these uh, darker grains Mm. and actually not even having them as part of the boil at all and that you just add it in maybe in the last minute or so. Um, And so technically, you know, we all know that something like a porter that's, that might have a hop IBU measurement equal to a pale ale, but because there's sort of less in that pale ale to interfere with your perception, the the porter may not have the perceived bitterness that sort of a, a clean pale ale might. Um, you know, so it's very likely an experiment could come along where we just add to one of these hopped up beers, you know, some cold steep. Uh, dark grains to kind of give it some porter, even uh, stout character, uh, and see what the perception is. I guess Mm -hmm. that'll be my challenge there to get you a series of beers where we could think about that. Yeah, that'd be a fun one. Yeah, and actually when uh, uh, Matt's note, we were talking about that, maybe not directly to the point, but again, the the beer 23 assay has uh, some real sort of specific details in here. But one of the things it does say in here, it says, note, uh, notice should be taken of recent findings that certain preservatives, such as this other stuff and this stuff, and possibly some brewing adjuncts or coloring agents may contribute to the absorbance at the wavelength specified by methods A and B, Hmm. meaning that if you might append to the adjunct, you might be adding some chemical compounds that will have the spectroscopic signature of an IBU but not have the bittering component. So you might actually artificially get a higher number when you do this beer 23 assay depending on if there were additives or sorbates or some other brewing adjuncts that it notes. Um, It does go on in this note to say that if you really want to know the answer you really need to move on to the next uh, assay. There's four of them within the beer 23 category. And, um, you know, they're just a lot more involved, a lot more handling of actually physically extracting those alpha acids and collecting that data on the HPLC, high-performance liquid chromatography. Hmm. And, you know, we could go there, but it, it would, you know, interpretation of the results wouldn't necessarily be as straightforward as maybe what we're looking at now. Scott Kuei, who's uh, my, my uh, home roasted coffee expert, says, uh, I think you need to set a new standard, perceived bitterness units. So PBUs instead of IBUs, which is an interesting, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if we find that the, the formulas... Uh, that we're using don't actually uh, give us an accurate uh, number on the actual IBUs. Maybe we should not refer to it as IBUs anymore, but as PBUs. Yeah, well, and it certainly is a good laboratory technique to make sure that you know certain protocols might be following, be followed. Um, 
But again, as a home brewer and sort of thinking about bitterness, uh, it certainly makes more sense to me to think about perceived bitterness more than it does this particular IBU assay. <laughs> I, I just essentially told myself that I'm worthless, uh, which, uh, which which is okay. I'm I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, Rasmus from Norway uh, writes in. He he has a background in organic uh, chemistry, uh, and have uh, analyzed several different mixtures of compounds, both living and synthetic sources. Often the results are not linear, but we assume they are linear linear in the range we want to analyze. We don't have much data to go on, but let's assume Brad made some beers with fewer or less hops, say 5 to 10 IBUs. Is it possible that in this range you could see a linear correlation and make a formula based on these results to calculate the IBU in beer? This would not be any problem if we all made beer with moderate hop contents, but many of us don't. We now know from the results Brad has presented that the results are not linear in the range from 20 to 50 IBUs, but is it possible that the formulas we use today to calculate IBU, Rager, Tenseth, et cetera, are made this way? So is it is it that we – our habits of brewing hoppier beers nowadays have uh, sort of outdated the, uh, the calculation tools that we use? Um, yeah, well, and it would be interesting to pose that question to the technical committee at the ASBC, uh, the ones who are the overseers of the Beer 23 uh, method, uh, because there are, like, for instance, uh, Beer 23B, uh, it says in the guidelines, this section has been archived, meaning that it's not an active way of carrying out the the analysis anymore. And so they are continually looking at these assays to see if they still are valid in today's time. Uh, this is a pretty old assay. Um, uh, I've uh, tried to have some correspondence with those folks, and I guess I wasn't diligent enough in making the connections, but it may be a place that we can move on to and uh, start asking them about um, you know, the validity in today's world. Hmm. Um, but you know, that's, a, that's a good question that, I'm sorry, the name of that individual was Rasmus Rasmus. Yeah. Um, and if you take this data, you know, one of the things that scientists do is, um, if I had a beer that had, uh, zero IBUs in it, you might, uh, um, have a, um, uh, a zero beer, right? And so zero, zero, a lot of times might work out to be a, a point on a curve, now, in this case where we did sort of 0.1 ounce, 0.3 ounce, 0.5 ounce, 0.7 ounce, where we went up by 0.2 ounces each time, um, you know, we could replot this data where you might be able to, to fit that data with a zero, zero point on there and use that to do your calculation. But, you know, one of the things we did talk about is that our ability to sort of perceive the differences in IBU measurements of, say, 5, 6, something like that. Um, you know, I think it's probably when you're at that lower level, it's not as critical um, to know exactly what the IBUs are. I mean, you know, we're not drinking necessarily a Newcastle or an Amberbach in order to really love that hop character. <laughs> You know, uh, so that maltiness will kind of dominate in that beer. So, you know, along with, uh, you know, a, a commercial idea is that maybe we talk, you know, there's a new parameter that we talk about um, a uh, percent alpha acid added, you know, to a particular. He wants to say, I've got the hoppiest beer around. Well, you should have a number that says I put in a pound per gallon. Mm -hmm. right? If you did that, I want to try your beer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't really care what the final lab analysis might be, but I, you know, I'd like to try that beer. Yeah. Uh, so again, that maybe could tie in with the perceived bitterness as well. Yeah. Or you see a, you see a PBU listed on the side of the bottle that might get your attention more than, uh, you know, an IBU. That's right. Yep. Or, or, uh, use, uh, C IBU. For calculated IBU, mm -hmm. so that you know that way it's it's not uh, it's not you know what the uh, instrument in the lab 
records, it's an indication of how much hops, you know, how many pounds of hops have been added into the into the barrel or whatever. Yeah, well, and I guess now we're getting into multi-definitions. Actually, I would probably say instead of C, you could have an M IBUs also. An M would be measured in the lab. Yeah. C might be calculated like the Tinseth or Rager methods based on what you just physically did, right? And so, um, you know, even though the method, the measured has a small calculation, it's it's really trivial. It's not like I'm whipping out my computational resources to do that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, Times 50, and, right? <laughs> so... Well, this has been uh, this has been really interesting. I think it, it as I you know said in the beginning, uh, our experiment that that uh, I thought would answer a question has uh, asked several more. Uh, but that's what science is all about. It's what it is. It's following up and and answering the further questions and and repeating experiments and and making sure that the answers that you got the first time were uh, were correct. And and it's just a, a journey. Yep. Well, we learn things along the way, and I think that's the the idea is that, you know, I tell my research students, they say, well, I'm not exactly sure where to go on this project, and I just look at them and I say, just go, mm. right? Just do it kind of thing. Like, well, we don't, won't know if it's the right path to follow until you get in the lab and start kicking out some numbers, and if you screw up, well, that's okay, and that's what we do <laughs> in science. Hopefully not the majority of the time, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of a uh, lot of things have come about because of uh, accidents or happy accidents. So. Oh yeah. Well, and actually, there's not a single artificial sweetener out there in the world, maybe with the exception of stevia, uh, but they were all found by accident. Huh. Uh, so, but that's for another show, I guess, or, <laughs> or another not show. <laughs> Well, all right, Brad. I will let you get back to your uh, students and, uh, you know, bringing up the next uh, generation of, uh, of scientists. And uh, I, I greatly appreciate your, your work and your time, and I look forward to next time. I do, too. Yeah, thanks, James. Well, thanks again to Brad and to everybody who wrote in with questions and comments. Very interesting to see how much IBUs faded after the beer had been in the bottle for two months. Very interesting. I look forward to more follow-up experiments with Brad, time permitting. Uh, you got to love science. You know, it does. you don't always get the answer that you think you're going to get. Sometimes you get more questions, and that's just fine. It's all part of the journey. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com. Or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. And believe it or not, still have a handful of brewers' logbooks. Uh, you can find them all on our site. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link. We appreciate the support. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Chicks Dig Time Lords, a celebration of Doctor Who by the women who love it, and... Misto M100S Gourmet Brushed Aluminum Olive Oil Sprayer. And a bonus this week since <laughs> I just couldn't pass it up. I love my miniature pincher mouse pad. So the <laughs> I just love the rhythm of some of those uh, some of the titles of these products. Thanks again everybody and remember I can't tell who bought Watson. No worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping or the new Amazon.co.uk link. And we greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links as well. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website, is provided by our buddy Kelly Dots in Austin, Texas. Boston, Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.